Welcome back everybody, this is the Johnny Mayor, and I am continuing with Final Fantasy 1 Dawn of Souls. And let us say, healed up my party members, and now we are going to use our specialty magic chime that we got in our last episode to access the Mirage Tower. So this is where the Mirage Tower is, located in the middle of this massive desert. And this is for frame of reference to the southwest of Gaia. So we gotta do some trekking. I'm sure we're gonna get into a random battle or two. Of course. Right before the tower. But now we're gonna head on in. So the Mirage Tower itself is not very long. It's only three floors. And uh, basically it's just a big circle. Now you can cut across the Mirage Tower without too much trouble. At least on the first floor. But you do have to watch out for the enemies in this area. Now, in our version of the game, and the current level that I'm at, most of these enemies are not going to offer much of a challenge. But especially if you're playing the NES version, you need to be very careful, because a lot of these enemies can actually cast some pretty nasty abilities, and uh, they're pretty strong as well. Alright, we got the Aegis Shield, or Aegis Shield, however you want to pronounce it. We got some Jill, and we got the Vorpal Sword. Now the Aegis Shield is okay. It's not that great. And the Vorpal Sword is not very useful. So, you know, you can check them out. Aegis Shield, of course, protects against stone, so that's nice. We'll throw that on our Fighter, or Knight, Jester. And now he's pretty much protected from instant death via the Protect Ring and also Stone. And of course, our two mages are protected, or wizards actually at this point, with their ribbons. And you'll notice the Vorpal Sword does not really upgrade us at all in terms of attack strength. So we're just going to stick with our regular equipment that we have right now. Still getting a lot of Jill, and hey, a Healing Helm. Now the purpose of the Healing Helm is kind of like the Healing Staff. And you're actually going to get another one of these in here. And uh, basically when you use it in battle as an item, it'll cast Heal on your party. So you can actually use all three of those once we get the second one to uh, have three of your party members each cast Heal. So that can recover, you know, 100 to 150 HP per battle and uh, you don't have to use any MP. Well, that's actually going to be useful once we finish the Mirage Tower and head to the Flying Fortress because basically we're going to be taking a lot more damage. So let's head up to the second floor of the Mirage Tower. This time you have to go all the way around the outer area and then we will finally be able to cut towards the middle where there's a nice collection of chests as well. Now the encounter rate is of course going up substantially. There are periods here, there's a little robot over there, where we're gonna be getting into fights every five or so steps, and it just gets worse once we get to the Flying Fortress. Now, to get to the chest, we need to actually cut in here and then go south. And you'll notice this huge blacked off area to the east. That is a massive room with the chests in. So let's get around the south here. You see these weird ruins over there. Those are not really anything of interest. And let's open up all eight of these chests. Thor's hammer is a equipable item. It's a weapon, but again, you can use it as an item in battle to cast Thundera. Sunblade. Now that's actually somewhat useful. That's a pretty good weapon. And also the Dragon Mail. Nice. So the Sunblade is effective against Undead, as it says, but it's actually a little bit stronger than the Defender Sword. And uh, the Dragon Mail can actually protect you from elemental attacks. So we're going to want to throw that on our Knight. Now the Sun Sword is a little bit stronger than the Defender, but its accuracy is a little bit lower. So you kind of got to balance it out. I will throw it on my Knight, and then I'll move my Defender over to my 
ninja just so that it uh, basically is maxing out his attack strength. And we'll keep the ice brand on my namesake. All right, and we're already almost done with the Mirage Tower. Now, this has been much longer for me because I'm having to do the random battles, but uh, this should really only be a couple minutes in terms of uh, me cutting out all the battles. And I am not looking forward to the Flying Fortress because there's four levels there that we have to traverse and uh, lots of random encounters. Now here's your clue about the warp cube that we picked up in the waterfall cave. So I guess technically you're supposed to come all this way, come into the Mirage Tower, and then you get the clue about it, which is kind of mean of the developers. Now this is a pressure plate, and we do have to fight an ice dragon, or blue dragon. So we're gonna take him out quickly. He's not too tough. Now he does have a nasty ability if you let him hang around, but obviously we can kill him pretty quickly. And uh, that is it for the Mirage Tower. So now we're gonna head up to the Flying Fortress, which is the home of Tiamat. Up we go. So the Flying Fortress has awesome music. I'm gonna save quickly. And uh, there are four treasure rooms in this area, one in each of the cardinal directions. So we're gonna head to the south first because that is actually the location of a weapon called the Razor. So that's an okay weapon. It's not great, but the key about it is it casts Scourge or Death. So if you use that as an item in battle, it'll actually cast an instant death spell on the entire enemy party that you're facing, I think. And uh, it syncs up with the, is it level? Six, seven, or eight, I don't remember, of the black magic. Might be eight, actually. So now we're gonna head to the east. There's another treasure room over here. And random encounter after random encounter. So many enemies. We're facing a lot of nightmares. We're facing a lot of those black knights and death knights. And here we actually have a new enemy, the Spirit Naga and Air Elemental. Not that they're gonna last very long. Wow, survived more than one hit. Impressive. All right, and we get a level up. So I am using my Healing Staff and Healing Helm to heal myself in between encounters here. Keep my HP up. And we did get our second healing helm there, so now we can have three party members do it. The last treasure room is to the west. So we'll head around the north end of this little room here, which had our original teleporter in. And we'll grab those chests. Can we get to it without another battle? Of course not. All right, what's in here? Chill, yay. A potion, yay. And more Jill. So lots and lots of money. That'll be helpful once we go after our level eight magic for a white wizard. <laughs> Come on, get to the teleporter. All right, floor two. Now there are six treasure rooms. And so they're in the... Okay, new enemy, Chimera. Not too tough, it will cast Blaze on your party, which can do fire damage to all of your party members. But only has around 300 hit points, so... Should die fairly quickly. But the treasure rooms are in the northwest, northeast, the east, the west, and then the southeast and the southwest. So we're gonna go in a clockwise direction. I'll start up here in the northwest and then we'll work our way over to the northeast. And then I will head down and then over and so on and so forth. And you'll notice the chests are not too helpful. It's all stuff we already have or 
stuff that has basically lost its usefulness a long time ago. It's very weird about games like this that they do that. That they put items like a potion this late in the game. Or even like a mithril helm. I mean, the mithril helm lost its usefulness a long time ago. But hey, we do get a third ribbon. So let's throw that on our ninja. So now all of our party members are protected against special abilities. And uh, some of them are also protected against elemental attacks, which of course is nice. Let's head down to the southeast. We got another treasure room down here. And we get some robes. The black robe and the white robe. Sort of the ultimate armor for your uh, wizards if you do happen to have them in your party. The black robe casts Blizzara in battle and the white robe will actually cast Blink on all of your party members. So, you know, we might as well equip it. Why not? You saw it actually lowered our evasion by a point compared to the ruby armlet. But what the hey, we'll put a nice robe on Avok. And this, my dear viewers, is the adamantite. So, as you might know from all Final Fantasies, usually the Adamantite is a thing that you need to forge oftentimes really awesome weaponry. And in this game, it is no different. There's a little side quest, once we finish up this area, that we will use that for, and we'll get one of the best swords in the game. You can probably guess what it's called. But that is it for the treasure rooms. Let's head to the south and we will access the teleporter to the next floor. Up we go. All right, this is the last treasure room floor. There's actually a special little scene here. We talk to this robot. He tells us to look out the window. Now in the original, all it does is give you a little note here about the different forces and how they converge on a single point in the middle of the globe. And it turns out that that point is the Chaos Shrine, which is the place we went at the absolute beginning of the game to take on Garland. But in all the remakes, we get a nice little cutscene here that illustrates exactly where that is, in case you didn't know that. Or remember it, I guess. So that's nice. That's ultimately where we're going to have to head once we end up beating Tiamat in this dungeon. But first, let's grab some more treasure. Alright, a Protect Cloak. Interesting. Note that this is the only shield that a wizard can equip. So of course we will throw that on our white wizard. Nice little boost there. <laughs> Clothes. <laughs> the most basic armor in the game. Thank you, treasure chest. Very useful. It's like the third or fourth treasure chest in this game that's had clothes in it. For whatever reason. Now I get that when they did the remakes, you know, they basically did perfect translation in terms of porting over exactly what was in each of the chests, but you know, you'd think they would change the contents of some of these chests to better items like X potions or you know, other stuff that's actually useful at this point. I am getting really sick of these random encounters. I am tired of fighting the same enemies over and over. And this encounter rate is ridiculous. Luckily, we're almost done. There's actually nothing to the south, it's just an empty room. So uh, once we equip this Sasuke's blade, we can actually head to the teleporter. And uh, that's about it for this episode. 
Now the Suzuki's blade is the ultimate weapon for the ninja. Now it's not the ultimate sword that the ninja can equip. There's actually a better sword we're gonna get a little bit later, but in terms of class specific weapon, that is the ninja's best weapon. But let's jump on the teleporter here. We're on the fourth floor. Now this is a maze. If you head in any direction, it'll just keep going. There are two ways to overcome the maze. You can head two spaces to the left and then two spaces up. We actually get some new enemies here. Guardians and soldiers. Guardians are the ones to look out for. The soldiers are pretty weak. But again, they're not gonna last very long. And the other way to beat the maze is to head two spaces to the right and two spaces down. And uh, that will take you to the teleporter, which will take you to the final floor of this dungeon. And once we get to that final floor, we have just our final elemental fiend to take on. But of course, we will be doing that in the next episode, because I have been recording for about 40 minutes, and I'm done for today. So as always, viewers, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode, and I'll see you all next time. So long.